Hello, I'm Julie. Welcome back. And today we're making New York inspired apartment building. In the previous video, I showed you how I made the overall composition of this scene. You can find the link to that video in the description. Now that the composition is finished, it's time to begin adding details. I usually try to avoid adding them too early because they tend to distract me from the overall composition. You also risk spending time on the details you might not end up needing. You just saw me separate a part of a building before adding edge loops to it. That's because I prefer working with separate meshes rather than having one mesh with a lot of edge loops going all around it. This keeps the model cleaner and easier to work with. Like here, I made the indentations for the windows on one floor so that later I can just copy them to the other. Here I'm adding all the details, designing one window. After that, I separate the entire window into its own object, because this way I can copy it as a duplicate. So that when I edit one window, it affects all of them. I'm adding color at this stage, before all the details are there, because color influences the composition as well. You might know that if you have two circles of the same size, but in different colors, the dark one will look smaller than the light one. That's why I like deciding on a general color palette early. At this stage, I'm just trying things. I have references of typical New York apartment buildings on the other monitor. I'm looking at what details different buildings have and seeing what works for my model. As you saw, I tried adding a white lintel on top of the window, but decided that it started looking too cluttered there and removed it. So I tried adding a white ledge instead, and I liked it more. Here, I just pressed Shift N to calculate normals outside. I do that often, since extruding faces the wrong way leads to geometry with flipped normals. You can't really avoid it, because you'd need to always remember which way the polygon was facing. So I just flip normals manually. You don't want to flip normals on your mesh, because this might cause some issues while rendering, or after you export it to another software. You can go to Viewport Overlays and check face orientation from time to time. Blue means polygon faces the camera, and red means normals are flipped. But what you can do alternatively is go to viewport shading and enable backface culling. This way, Blender won't render polygons facing away from the camera and you will instantly notice if the normals are flipped, like I did here with the sign. Here I'm copying this element instead of using an array modifier. I wanted to tell you why. Array modifier helps you create multiples of an object in a non-destructive way so that you can adjust things later. It also helps to copy objects along a line. In all other cases, I just copy the object manually. I decided to add a pizza place on the first floor, because that was the most New York thing I could think of. And I thought it would add some visual interest with the lights coming from a cafe, a cool colorful sign, and an outdoor seating area. I always keep the final image in mind while modeling. That's why you see me looking at the scene from the camera angle a lot. I don't want to add details you won't be able to see in the finished work. That's also the reason why I tend to exaggerate the proportions a lot. Like I said in the first video, I post my work to Instagram, so I want the image to look appealing when viewed on smaller devices. Like in this case, I made windows much bigger than they would be in a real building. Small elements like window frames, blinds, door handle are much more chunky than in real life. All that makes the entire work look more friendly and cheerful in my opinion. And that's exactly what I'm going for. Since I'm making a typical New York apartment building, of course I had to add a fire escape. I made the railing and the balusters by converting an edge to a curve. I did that using a custom shortcut add-on that I mentioned in the first video, but of course you can do the same without any add-ons. Let me show you how. You need to right-click on an object in object mode and choose Convert to Curve. In Curve tab in Geometry, change the depth. You can also change the curve resolution here. If you know you don't need to adjust the curve later on, you can convert it back to Mesh. By the way, look, this is what I was talking about earlier. I used an array modifier to distribute these steps along the ladder because I needed them to be at a very specific angle. You've probably noticed that I simplified the fire escape a lot. This vertical ladder in the back is not even connected to the staircase. That's because I can't recreate the realistic staircase in this style. It simply won't work. I can't afford to have that many details there, because first, you won't be able to see them, and second, they're gonna make this part of an image look cluttered. 
but most importantly, that's going to make the rest of the scene look unfinished. That's why I'm usually aiming to have a consistent level of detail throughout the image. Because if something has more details, your attention will be immediately drawn to that part of an image, and it will be immediately obvious that the rest of the objects aren't detailed as much. You can use this to your advantage, though, by adding more details only to the parts of the image you want the viewer to pay attention to. This way, you can trick your viewers to think that the image has more details than it actually does. Like here with this air conditioner unit, I really wanted it to look very friendly, very rounded. I wanted to exaggerate how big the details were. And I really had to stop myself from adding details you wouldn't be able to see in this one. It was so tempting to add some rivets on the front panel, but after checking it from the camera angle, I realized that would be completely pointless. I also realized that I could push the size of the propeller to be even bigger. I used boolean here to make the circle-shaped indentation, because to make it with geometry I'd have to add way too many edge loops. Here I'm making a flower pot. You've probably noticed that I didn't start it by making a new cube primitive, I copied the air conditioner. That's because if I can reuse geometry, I always try to do that. Here I'm adding color and materials. Important part of this process is making an object stand out from the background. As you saw, I didn't like the flower pot to be the color of the blinds, and I couldn't make it much darker because then it would look too much like the red color of the walls, so I changed the blinds to be white. Here I'm starting to make the plants. I have something like a snake plant in mind. Here is what I'm doing. I extrude a vertex to make an overall shape of the plant. Then add a subdivision surface modifier to make it smooth. Tweak the position of the leaves to make them look good from the camera angle. And add a skin modifier. If you're making multiple objects like I do here, you need to mark one vertex of each as a root. Selecting the vertices and pressing Ctrl A lets you adjust the thickness of the leaves. Pressing Shift X or Shift Y after Ctrl A allows you to make the leaves wider. Notice that you can use Ctrl A in combination with proportional editing to make a plant gradually thinner or thicker. I also use this technique to make trees, which I will show you in the fourth video of the series, where we will be making a park island. Here I'm starting to make an outdoor seating area. I decided to add only one table and two chairs, because I'd rather have less items, but make them more detailed. And this is exactly enough to understand that this is a sitting area of an outdoor cafe. Here you can see I added subdivision surface modifier early. I'm previewing it in edit mode while working on low poly geometry. That allows me to see what the model will look like after the subdivision surface modifier is applied. This is my regular workflow. If I know that I'm going to need a subdivision surface modifier on an object, I add it right after creating the object. By the way, Subdivision Surface Modifier is probably the easiest modifier to add. You just press Ctrl and then 1, 2, 3, etc. for the number of levels of subdivision that you want. So for example, to have two levels of subdivision in the viewport, you press Ctrl 2. Here I'm making an awning over the window. To make this bottom part rounded, I selected two bottom vertices and beveled them. I made one stripe first and copied it multiple times. In this particular case, I think it would have been easier to do this using an array modifier, though. To give the fabric some depth, I extruded faces along normals. Here I'm starting to work on the pizza place sign. I added a text object and adjusted its parameters. In text tab in geometry, I changed the depth of extrusion, changed the resolution of the text and its font. By the way, let me know in the comments if you know which pizza place I was inspired by while naming this pizzeria. I chose green as the main color of the sign, because green will stand out on the red background of the building. That's because red and green are complementary colors, meaning when placed next to each other, they create the strongest contrast. On the color wheel, complementary colors are located on the opposite sides. Usually I don't consciously use color theory, but I feel like it definitely influences my tastes in what looks good and what doesn't. I think the reason for that is actually movies, where they use color theory everywhere especially complementary colors, like here. Here I'm using an array modifier because I want to be able to adjust the placement of the tiles. I add one array modifier to make a row of tiles, and then add another one to make multiple rows. I thought the sidewalk was looking a little bit boring, 
so I decided to add this doormat. I decided that the outdoor sitting area could use some more details. So I decided to add some food on the table. It's an Italian place, so I thought pasta would be cool. You might be thinking, Julie, you made this pasta bowl way too big. And that's exactly what I was talking about in the beginning of the video. I exaggerate details. A lot. If I made the pasta bowl regular size, it would have been too small for the final image. Now you can see me working on the base of the island. I decided to go with bricks for the urban feel. I know having bricks there is not realistic, but just plain beige ground wasn't really looking too exciting. Of course, the bottom part of the island takes a lot of space in the final composition of the image. And if it would be a standalone scene, I would add more details to the bottom part. But as you remember, it's a part of a four island scene that I designed in the first video, so you won't see much of these bricks. I'm adding details on the roof now because it occupies a lot of screen space in the final image. I'm making the pipes on the roof using the same workflow I explained earlier, where you convert an edge to a curve and then give it some depth. That's it for the modeling part. I'm rendering with Cycles because it doesn't take that much time, since graphics cards are really good these days. Unlike Eevee, Cycles renders ambient occlusion as a separate pass, so you need to enable it here before rendering. You add ambient occlusion in compositing, like so. Connect rendered image and ambient occlusion outputs to a multiply node. Add a color ramp node to tweak ambient occlusion to your liking. Ambient occlusion pass is not denoised during the rendering, so you need to add a denoise node. Ambient occlusion imitates shadows, and shadows in real life are never just black, so I'm adding a color balance node to give it some blue tint. That's it for this video. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below, I'm gonna try to answer them. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to see more videos. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Keep an eye, there will be more videos from me on this channel. I'll see you next time.